right. Well, good morning. I didn't know if my slides were going to work, so I'll use the, the real object lesson. Do you guys like to garden? Yeah? How many of you have put, planted any seeds this year? Awesome. Okay, so I have a question. You obviously can figure out what those are, right? What are they? They're flowers. Yeah. They're called, uh, I think these are carnations. It's a perennial mix. And again, poppies. You like poppies? I like poppies. You eat them. I don't want to know about that. <laughs> are they good? Are they? I didn't know that, really. I've got poppies. I might have to try it. Okay, so what's this? Squash. Squash. Do you like squash? Yeah. You know, I don't think your daddy likes some squash, do you? There's some squash you don't like, some squash you do like. Okay, how about this? Squash. Okay, how about this? Squash. Squash. Yeah. Nope, those are squash. See what it says above? Squash. Huh, those are all squash. Does anybody know what this is? Thank you. It's squash. It's pumpkin squash, isn't it? Do you know if you pulled all the seeds out of these, bo these bags and you said they were squash and I was holding them in your hand, in my hand or your hand, you might not be able to tell the difference. Did you know that? Because those seeds look very, very similar. Right here, that's an acorn squash seed. And right here, this is a yellow seed. Yellow squash seed. They look alike, don't they? And this is a green squash seed. I don't mind. Okay, well, I want you to see them all. Okay, there's the first one. There's, they all look the same, don't they? So let me ask you a question. If I put all those seeds in my hand and I just threw them out there and threw them in the garden, would you know what was growing? That's right, until it made fruit, which is squash, then you would know, right? You probably know if you planted a corn seed, because it looks different than a squash seed. And you'd know if you planted a green bean seed, because it looks different than a squash seed, right? Well, do you know that sometimes in our life, Satan likes to trick us? Last year, I planted a pepper plant. I thought I planted a sweet banana pepper. But when it grew up... It was a habanero pepper. And me and Zoe ate. And Ellie and Zoe ate a bite of it. Was it hot? I didn't eat it. It just got all over me and Zoe sipped it. I was like, hot, 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 hot. <laughs> it was hot. It was a shock. It wasn't what we expected, right? And sometimes in our life, we come to church, and when we're young, we're getting seeds thrown in our brains, right? And we won't know whether they were got planted until you get big. But we want you to do what's necessary to let those seeds grow. And if it was a squash plant, and it doesn't matter what kind of squash grew, does it? Squash is good. So you can be all kinds of squash and still be good seed, right? But sometimes we don't know what you're going to be until you get bigger. And that's okay. God puts the good seed in good soil, we water it, we put it in the sunshine, and we pull weeds out of it, and when you get really tall and big, because some of you guys are going to be really tall, you're going to be looking at the top of my head by next year, when you get big, remember, it doesn't matter what kind of squash you are, it's just good, okay? You might not know until you get bigger. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for gardens, for seeds, for the good seed, for the things that are promised to us. I pray you would bless each one here. Thank you that we could come together and we could talk about you again. We pray in your name. Amen. Thanks, guys. I'll give you seeds afterwards. If you listen to the story today and pick out the five things that we need to grow good plants, I'll give you what I've got a treat or a seed. Is it my story? Yeah. A treat or seeds, whichever you prefer, okay? Come see me afterwards. Not a tree. I don't have any trees. Okay.
Then there are those who listen carefully to the good news and open their hearts to me. They put me first in all they do because they love me. And like a good seed, they produce a great harvest to many people who also love me. Amen. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Zoe. Okay. Special message with us this morning. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Hi. Wow, it's been a long time, it seems like. It's always nice to be with my family here. It's not that we don't love you. I hope you understand that. We're just taking part of the time, especially with Pastor when he had his surgery. We've been helping out at the Parma Church a lot. So we go back and forth, and uh, we love our family here too, just so you know that. <laughs> anyway, thanks much, a very great deal there, Miss Ellie. I appreciate you reading the scripture for us today. That was great. As a grandma, I'm a little bit proud. For Forgive me. <laughs> uh, we're, we are start, We're going to study out of the book of Matthew today, and that would be Matthew 13, and Ellie read from verse 23. We did talk in our children's story about gardening, and um, how many of you out there are gardeners? Awesome, yep. I think it's prerequisite to be a good Christian, you have to like dirt. <laughs> You have to dig in the dirt. There's so many object lessons and so many spiritual things that we can take from a growing plant and the seed. And so this may seem like things you already know, but I know as I was thinking about it again this year, uh, this spring, as I was planting, how important it is to understand that process that really comes in the garden. It starts in the garden, uh, and it ended in the garden and it's a very important part of our Christian walk. So, But you know, sometimes gardening can be challenging if you haven't done it for a year or so. Um, this year, I got really, I would say, maybe lazy or ingenious. I'm not sure which. But uh, we had some leftover bales of straw from our nativity scene this spring, or this spring, this winter. And um, we took those bales of straw to our house afterwards and they were sitting there through the snow and the rain and they were getting kind of beat up looking and a little bit broken down and I had read about how people grew tomatoes in bales of straw and I thought well this is ingenious if I can get my guys to move those heavy bales of straw that are full of water to my garden area I want to put them out there and I did I planted four tomato plants and one pepper plant We'll see what kind of pepper plant it ends up being. But I planted one pepper plant out in my bales of straw. And thus far, they look really, really good. So I'll tell you how that story turns out later. But when the soil's hard, which sometimes it can get to be out here because it's so hot, right? And sometimes it's hard to get those weeds pulled out. And it's hard to break up that soil. And sometimes it's hard to get water to where you want it to be. All those things have a spiritual message in them. But let's pray one more time before I really launch into this. Father, I thank you so much that you're the author and the finisher of our faith, that you are not trying to talk above our heads. You want to see us eye to eye, and someday we will see you eye to eye. And I can't even comprehend that. But right now, you want to speak to us in ways that we can understand the message you have for us. So as I share, Lord, I pray you would make it just very obvious and real and that our hearts will be drawn to you and the love you have for your kids. We pray in your name. Amen. So we're going to start um, in the garden. You know, Adam and Eve had the privilege of walking hand in hand eye to eye, voice speaking directly from the throne of God. He, he was a friend to them, present. Hard to understand that. And in the garden, because they had everything that they could possibly ever want, there really was nothing that would take them away except the temptation to serve themselves. And Satan knew that. See, that's his trick. So in the garden, Adam and Eve became separated from God because they wanted to serve themselves. In the garden, Jesus chose to be separated from his father, 
to serve us. It started in a garden, and the temptation was overcome in the garden. And someday we were going to go back that, to that paradise, to that garden in heaven. And that's, that's more than we can understand and comprehend. I think uh, Nebuchadnezzar was trying to recreate that beautiful garden and his hanging gardens. There's so many different stories, if you look through the Bible, that have, that have tried to recreate what God intended. But it can't happen. It can't happen unless God is the one making it happen. And that is yet to come. But while we're on earth, he wants us to understand the process that he's taking us through so he can do that. So he can come back and take us home with him. And it pretty much is similar to what it's like growing a garden. Okay, kiddos, here's what you want to write down. Remember, okay? Five good things we need to grow a garden. Five good things. Anybody have the first thought? Yeah? Good. Very good, Charlie. Good soil. One that's broke up and conditioned and has lots of nutrients, right? Okay, what's the second thing? Is anybody else? Oh, okay, I have to go over here. I'll come back to you, okay? Yeah, Zoe. Good water. That's right. That's right. Yes, Ellie. You need sunshine. Let's do the lily. Charlie, you give me one. You're on the map already, okay? Lily? Seeds. That's right. Okay, we have one more thing. I don't see Andrew over there. <laughs> okay, Charlie. You forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll think of it. Yes, Lily. Well, some plants need shade, yes. Okay, so we've got soil, seeds, sunshine, water, and probably one of the most important things, yes. Anybody else? Pardon? Love. Well, love is good, yeah. There's something to that, too, yes. Time, that's good, too. I didn't think of that one, so you got more than I've got. The last one I have on my list is a good gardener, Okay. You need somebody to pull the weeds, right? Okay, so we got a gardener, sun, soil, water, and seed. Okay, remember them. Okay, the book of Matthew talks about, let's go to Matthew 13, and we'll just start reading there. I'm sorry, I don't have it on overhead, so if you want to pull a Bible out or get your handy-dandy, what'd you call that, a holy, holy device, okay? <laughs> Matthew 13. I like it. <laughs> we start reading in verse 3. It says, Jesus, then he, Jesus, spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I don't know if you've ever been a farmer, but there's something about having to depend on God when you're a farmer. When you're a gardener, it's not a given. Now, out here we have irrigation canals, and we have water that's supplied. And back in the Midwest, where I grew up, we had dry land acres pretty much. And you depended on the spring rains and the summer rains to develop a crop. And it is almost impossible to be a farmer. As a matter of fact, I don't know how you could not believe in God and be a farmer. But there are people who say they don't believe because it's a miracle every year that those, those crops come up and that they yield. And there are some years, I could tell you back when I was a grain merchandiser, the years that it didn't work so well, 83, 88, 92, <laughs> because we had markets that were crazy. And, and, uh, but it's not the rule of thumb. We depend on God to bring the rains. You know, so much of the time, 
we think in life, and maybe you don't, but I know I do, we get going in life and we forget that life is fragile. It's so fragile at any given moment. Things could happen and it could be over. I was going out to do an adjustment this week out in Wilder, for one of our big seed growers, and, and while I was going, there was this ambulance just zipping by, and it went around me, and it went into Wilder, and I had to go to the uh, grocery store to pick up something, and when I, I was, saw up on the horizon all the sirens and all the ambulances, there was a head-on collision. You know, a baby plant is very, very fragile much like we are. And there's so many ways that Satan can attack and take it out. The story of the sower, I think Jesus is trying to point out to those that were following him and had been listening to some degree how fragile life is. How important it is to be able to, if you're thinking of eternal things at all, how important take note of the, the expense, the cost, the effort it takes to keep your garden ready for the eternal uh, chance that we have. I'm sure the person who was driving in Wilder this week had no thought that this evil was going to come against them. They probably would have not gone there if they'd known that. And I think Jesus wants us to understand that we never know when the attack is going to come to us. As our baby plants are growing, it is so important to have our garden prepared appropriately. The good soil. Jesus is talking about the fact when the farmer goes out to throw that seed, because they didn't have John Deere planters back then, they didn't do rows, they just cast their seeds, you know. And he's out there and he's casting this, the growers uh, out there throwing the seeds out. And some of those seeds are going to fall on the hard wayside, the, the dirt that has been trounced on and tromped down and beaten down so much so that there's no chance that that seed's ever going to get planted in the dirt. I think the significance of that is, is obvious if you're trying to grow a garden. You need to break up the soil, right? For those of us that have, uh, have a passion to see the people that we love that may not be following Jesus right now in the church, to accept him as their savior, to even recognize him as a God, maybe their heart is hard. Maybe it's been stepped on. Maybe it's been uncultivated for so long that they don't even care. They don't even get it. I don't understand why you weird people even go to church. Science says. Because they have been exposed to Christians who haven't been serious about their existence as a Christian. You know, we can, we can represent ourselves as such, but if our hearts are hard and the dirt's packed and there's no love of God growing in it, what example do we give to people to want to join us? So I think Jesus is saying, you know, there are people dying out here. There are people that are unprepared. There are people that don't know about me. And they have hard hearts. They are looking for more because I believe without God, you are always looking for more, aren't you? For those of you who have been without him, you know what I'm talking about. God is calling the gardeners to breaking up soil. To the, to the mission of letting people know what a good God we have. We have a good God, right? Amen. Our hearts are not hard, are they? No. But guess what? If they are, it's okay. Because I, I think there's a really 20-bottom plow out there, <laughs> or bigger. I love it. 
Gary, your parents understand what I'm talking about because they're from Wisconsin. <laughs> this is great. They get it. I was born in a corn and soybean farm, and uh, my brother still farms. And some of this equipment nowadays is getting so big, you have to fold it in thirds practically to get it down the road. I think that's us. I think we're kind of the cultivators today. And it would be awesome if we really understood that mission is part of the process of breaking up the hard soils. I'm sure we could all think of somebody that's got no time for Christians. Yet, they're looking. It says in verse 9, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's harder and harder in the world we live in today to get people's attention because we are competing against so many other things that seem to be more fun, more healthy, more healing, more whatever you want to say. They're taking the, the blessings that we have as far as sharing our Heavenly Father away from us. It's the same thing that's happening in gardening and farming too. Developers are coming in and they're buying up all the farmland. And the more we cover that farmland with houses, the less we understand the parable of the sower. So many people are after the almighty dollar and the, the fix to get enough income that we never have to worry about anything anymore, and we're not letting the seeds of God fall within our stony hearts. And it's not hard to understand why this is happening in the real world here today because a farmer gets all his land for 10, 10 years' worth of income, minimum, right now. It makes a lot of sense. And the new generation coming up doesn't care about it anymore. And it's the same thing happens spiritually. Sabbath afternoon can be spent watching sports, being participating. So my brother, who's, I would say, an amazing dad and loves his kids, but they're on the road every weekend playing baseball. Now, they go to church on Sundays. <laughs> but when our minds and our hearts and our, our soil of our own heart is so coated over and walked upon and practicing things that have nothing to do with God, we get a little bit jaded, and we get a little bit hardened. And it's a little bit harder for us to even talk about how good God is. Talking about the second soil as we move from there. Because we wouldn't see ourselves as that. Because we are here today, and we do read our Bibles. And I would say all of us here are good soil, okay? Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm talking about other people. <laughs> but this is a self-check, okay? We can, we can check ourselves, because I don't know your heart where it's at. I can't judge it by the outside. That's something between you and God. Because this next soil looks really good. But it's just not very deep. It can grow a crop that starts off sprouting really well, but then it just kind of drops over. Whenever there's any temptation, whenever there's any pressure, when the trials get to be such that it's just not comfortable anymore, they leave. And how many times we have evangelism programs where our people will come in and they'll learn the truth and they're excited about it, but then when the trials come, the back door is so busy you can't hardly keep them from going out. Not because they're bad people, not because they don't want God, it's because the root hasn't gone down deep. And it's so easy when you come in and you meet this new family and you're hungering and you're thirsting for knowledge and we all love them up because we're all really good folks. But they don't put their own root down. And they depend on us and not on God. You see, it says that, that we're going to have trials and some of the best crops are the ones that are actually stressed the most. Because they put a deep taproot down. And when the winds blow and the things happen, they don't fall over. We had this huge, humongous, it took eight people to hold hands to go around this tree we had back in uh, uh, Sandy, Oregon. 
a big O, what kind was it, Doug fir? It was a big O Doug fir, it was beautiful. But Doug firs were known for not having very deep roots because they grow where it's really rainy and wet. And if that big Doug fir had fallen towards our house, we would have had no house. It was huge. At least no living room and kitchen. <laughs> And that, that doesn't mean that it wasn't a beautiful tree. It doesn't mean it didn't do good things. And it didn't mean that it was going to fall over. But if the root didn't go deep and it was tested too much, it could fall over. So Jesus is trying to tell people that can hear, people that are listening, people that get it, because you're excited about Jesus and because you've now become part of his family, don't give up when it gets hard. Because you're going to be persecuted. And trials are going to come against you. And we that have been in the walk for a while, we all know that. We could tell you about this and this and this and this. And this right? You could do that. But at the, at the end of the day, we know who our Redeemer is, don't we? Because he saved us through that. Not from it, but through it. In spite of it. And when we have young believers and young people and, and folks that are asking us about our faith and they say, but if there's a good God, why did this happen? And you say, well, you know what? We have an enemy. And he hates us. And he wants to take us out. You see, the, the seed that was planted in the shallow soil was a great seed. It was good dirt on top, but they did take the time to Break open that rock so the root could go deep. Now, weeds, weeds, they don't need a lot of dirt, right? You know what pigweed is? Does anybody know what a pigweed is? They probably call it something different here, but back in the Midwest, they call it pigweed. Pigweed can grow on a rock, literally. You get about that much dirt and about a half an ounce of water in a year, and that bugger will grow that tall. I mean, they are amazing, <laughs> And their roots get deep. They get around rocks, and you cannot pull those things out for anything. This takes us to the third thing. When a seed gets, a good seed gets dropped into what was good soil, like a squash or corn, somehow pigweeds always grew up around them, especially green beans and buttonweeds. You probably don't have them out here, but we had buttonweeds back in Iowa. When Katie was about four foot nothing, well, she's only that now, about three foot nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry, sweetheart. <laughs> you are five foot. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was mean mom. We were homeschooling, and I'd send the kids out to go pull weeds. I said, this is a spiritual lesson. <laughs> and they would be, <laughs> they, they didn't like me much. <laughs> and she would try very, very hard to pull these button weeds out. And they did a good job for about ten minutes. <laughs> Because they were big weeds. And that's what I see here as we're talking about, you know, the, the good soil, a good seed, but they get choked out by the seeds that Satan somehow plants in this awesome soil we have. You see, he looks and he says, ha, they think they have it all worked out now, but wait. I'm going to throw a few pigweed, a few buttonweeds. Oh, let's put in a little thistle. Yeah, how about that other stuff that grows out here that... Goat heads, yeah, goat heads, cockleburs, and how about that grass, that cheat grass, yeah, man, everywhere. Thank you, Andrew. I love it. Yeah, see, they grow, and did you plant them? No, you didn't plant them, but we have an enemy, and he loves to drop and in the Bible, it talks about, it goes on in Matthew 13 about darnel, which is this weed seed that looks just like wheat. And he drops them in there and he says, oh, watch this, they're not going to know the difference between the good and the bad. It's going to just grow right up along with the good. And you know what happens? They have to leave it because if you pulled the bad seed, the good seed would die too. And the thing that, Je that Jesus is trying to get across to, to his followers at this point is, you got to prepare the soil and pay attention. 
You don't put that good seed in and say, okay, I was baptized, and I went to Bible study a couple years ago, and, uh, you know, I read my Bible once a week when I come to church. He says, no, man, you've got to be a gardener. You've got to pull weeds all the time. And if you get that little darnell before it gets up, even with the wheat seed, you can get rid of it. But if you don't pay attention, the button weeds get bigger than the green beans, and the pigweeds shadow them, and you're not going to get a very good crop. It's work being a Christian, isn't it? Now, we're not supposed to work our way to heaven because it's by grace that we are saved, by faith. It's the faith that we have and trust we have in Jesus, that he has done it all for us. He won it in the garden by saving us, choosing us over himself. But he says, You're a garden growing as well. And you're going to have fruit. You're going to tell people about me. You know, it says in Help from Daily Living, which is one of my favorite little books, sharing books ever, and I can tell you I think I'm still a Christian because of it. Written by Ellen White, Help in Daily Living, Practical Guide to Everyday Blessings. Simple. It speaks simple words to me. It's not very long, so I can read it. It says, the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. You've got to pull a lot of weeds out to stay loving in this world, don't you? Because there's a lot that could take our hearts away. There's a lot of things that can make us doubt God. It says there's, one of the chapters is the discipline of trial. It says, people pray for Christ-likeness of character, for a fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil of their nature. Faults are revealed of which they did not even suspect that existed. Like Israel of old, they question, if God is leading us, why do all these things come upon us? Why is that? It's because God is leading them that these things come upon them. Trials and obstacles are what the Lord uses to discipline us and appoint um, and appointed success, conditions of success. In other words, he's looking, he's having us see where the weeds are so that we can take care of them. He doesn't want us to have weeds. He would not plant the weeds. The enemy plants the weeds. One more time. He does not plant the weeds. The enemy plants the weeds. He allows the trials to come against us so that we can see what is separating us from him. That's the shade that's blocking the the warmth and the sunshine and the love and the joy and the abundance that God wants to give us because we are letting those weeds continue to grow in our garden. And it's up to us to pull them out. And how do you do that, you say? Well, we're not supposed to work our way to heaven. You're right. But what do we do? We surrender. Have you sung this song? I surrender all. (laughs) I surrender all. All to Jesus. I surrender. Lord, I'm a mess. I just barked at my kids. I just felt tempted to cheat on my taxes. (laughs) I don't like these new neighbors that park that two-story garage right behind my garden. I don't care that they're nice people. I don't like them. (laughs) Oh, boy, that's really successful, right? I'm not going to go witness to them. Hey, you want to learn about Jesus? (laughs) In Parma, I said I wanted to take my paintball gun and shoot their garage and I actually got a lot of followers. They thought I was real human when I told them that. But, you know, that isn't the right character. That isn't God. That's selfish. And I became very aware of how selfish I was and still am. And I'm struggling with that. And I don't know what your deal is. I mean, we all get those weeds planted in our garden by the enemy. But Satan is very wise and very cruel and very unforgiving and unrelentless and we'll spend our whole life pulling weeds but the good news 
The more we allow God to show us, the more we're willing to let that happen, the more we can open up the beautiful sunshine and let it in. First Corinthians 2.14, it says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, once we become part of God's family, we've accepted the seed into the soil of our heart, we're no longer a natural man. Now we either become a spiritual person or we become a carnal person. And a spiritual person is aware that we're fighting a battle, and a spiritual person is also aware that we need to surrender to allow God to work in our field, to let us pull those weeds. Some people will always stay in that carnal, and it's a carnal believer. And a carnal believer is just fine having the weeds in their their garden, and they're perfectly fine not fighting the battle. They just say, I'm a Christian, I'll come sit here, I'll do what I'm supposed to do, but I'll never do any more than that. And I will contend that eventually you'll be choked out and you'll never want to come again. And you certainly won't want to share Jesus with anyone. It's a battle. It's a battle for your soul. The last uh, opportunity, or the last example that Jesus gives is uh, the one where the heart is ready. The heart is willing to accept the seed, it's prepared. It knows that there will be trials and it will be persecutions. It knows that they can't do it by themselves. And they're totally and humbly dependent upon God. They're willing to let the roots go down deep. And they're also willing to put self aside for others. I want to be like that field. I want to be like that. And I think Jesus wants us to be like that. But I think it would be very naive to think that we are completely like that. Because where there is human being, there is sin. Right? And I hate that. But sin abounds. But the good news is where sin abounds, love abounds more. And the master gardener is more than happy to point them out and pull them, help you pull them. I think they have a a winch or a a good cultivator in heaven that uh, they're ready to send on the mission when we cry out for help. That's all you have to do. Lord, I'm not able. I see it. I don't want it. Would you please come and help me pull these weeds? And we'll keep our soil as good as it can be. And I think when God looks down, he says, look at those little plants. (laughs) They're growing. They're going this way and that way, trying to find the sun constantly. Some of them are a little crooked, but that's okay. (laughs) Some of them need to have a weed whacker. Some of them need our mighty winch to pull out those deep pigweeds. Because the cares of the world will try to choke out our faith. You know, we really understand how much we need it when we get drawn into tight places. I was listening to a sermon last night. And it was, uh, it was one of the is, It Is Written not too long ago. And it was talking to, a, he was interviewing people who had been through the fires in California. Oh, couldn't imagine that. And he was asking the questions like, do you believe in God still? And how, how's your faith? And how did you feel at the time it happened? And, and this one family is interviewing, it was just precious. She said, yeah, you know, it was terrible. And we are so sad. But at the time it was happening, we knew our Heavenly Father was listening to us. And they were praying. And they were praying the prayers from Psalms 34 and Psalms 91. And many people have sung the song from Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High 
shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the, so the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. The Lord is our shield. He is our master gardener. He is the weed puller. He is the one that is listening to our heartfelt cries. And he wants us to be more than just shallow soil. He wants us to be deep with roots that go deep, that go beyond what we see in the world today and all the ugliness and all the things and all the ways that Satan can plant weeds in our minds about God's love. He wants us to put that stuff aside and pull out those weeds and shut off the TV if you need to and go dig in the dirt. Get back to God. Get back to Him. The real stuff in the world because someday soon, we may face a terrible accident. Someday soon, we may end up in a place where life's not so good. I can almost bet on it. And we certainly all have to face the ultimate someday of death. But if we've learned to cast our cares upon him, because he cares for us, if we've put those scriptures in our minds and in our hearts and we've done the first works to start pulling out the weeds, when the, when the things come and the evilness is upon us, we'll have deep roots. And sometimes we don't know until that happens. And this week was one of those testing times for me. Um, you all know how much I love my grandkids. I mean, that's, that's life. And our little five-year-old grandson uh, was out at the zoo. His mommy and daddy are selling a house. There's all these things that are going on and lots of stress, although it sold in two days, so it's not so bad. <laughs> we get a phone call from our son. Um, something's up with Bennett. They were at the, gar they were at the, at the uh, zoo. He got this severe headache, and he started vomiting. Now, when a five-year-old starts vomiting and with a severe headache, you don't mess around, right? So they took off and they went, because he was perfectly fine before that happened. They went to the ER. And messages kind of got messed up on how bad it was at that moment in time. And Dave and I talked, and it sounded like he was unconscious. And, and I was in the middle of a field adjusting peas at the time. I'm like trying to hold it together until I was able to get away from the farmer I was with and get on the road. And I said, I'll be there momentarily downtown. I can tell you, as soon as the door shut, the person that I was taking back to his office, as soon as it shut, I cried out to God. And I wasn't very nice about it. I'm yelling at God. You have promised and I'm quoting scripture, and I'm saying, save this boy. And I cried, and then I felt the peace that passes understanding come over me. I don't know how to describe it. I know God cares about him more than me. I know he's able to do it. I'm not able to do anything except cry out to God. We don't know what it was even now. I think it was a migraine is what we decided, right? Got better. Wanted to eat supper. I don't think he did. Actually, he ate, didn't eat till next morning. He's fine. Just don't know what happened. I'd like to say it was because we had so many people praying. We lost our dog. Katie's dog ran away. We, wait, we prayed all day long, prayed all day long, all day long. And about 15 minutes after the little girls prayed, the dog shows up. <laughs> does God listen to our prayers? Amen. He does. Is he willing to do what it takes in order to get us ready for heaven? 
Yes. Is he kind and gentle and loving more than we could possibly imagine? Does it always work out great? No. Do we always get the answer we want? No. But I'm totally convinced that he is able to keep what we give to him for eternity. So if this ends here today on my drive home, I'll see you in heaven. Right? And that's where we put it. I'm pulling the weeds out so I can have faith that someday when it happens, because it's going to happen, I am going where I want to go. Because I've been willing to put my deep root down into the one who can save me. And that's the challenge for each of us as gardeners of our own heart. Let Jesus water it, give you the sunshine, give you the nutrients. He'll put the good seed in. All we have to do is let him and work alongside him. That's the good news. Let's have our closing song now. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you see beautiful plants here. You see people who are turning their faces to you and are willing to be made willing to be made willing, Lord. Wherever it takes, God, we want to surrender that to you today. We want you to pull weeds and show us the tears and show us the things that about our character that we, we don't want. And hard, it's hard sometimes, Lord. We don't like dealing with that stuff. We'd rather ignore it. But God, you want us to be ready. You want us to have faith. You want us to have hope. You want us to know love. So God, we just ask you to begin the good work in us. And Lord, as we are faithful to follow, as we are surrendered and humbled by your love of us, Help us to grow. Help our root to go deep. And help us to be a, a glorious and wonderful testament to you and the power you have. And we pray these things in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.